the Detroit Public Library, Social Science, Education, and Religion Department is happy to present the preservation of Malcolm X's Inkster home and Detroit history. In the summer of 2021, a nonprofit organization, Project We Hope, Dream, and Believe, was awarded over $380,000 in federal grant money to preserve the formal home of American civil rights leader Malcolm X in Inkster, Michigan. From July 18th to the 23rd of 2022, a team from Wayne State University's Department of Anthropology, led by Dr. Krista Rosinski, conducted excavations around the property of the home located at 4336 William Street. It was recognized by the National Register of Historical Places after being placed on the demolition list for nearly two decades. The home is slated to be transformed into a museum, highlighting Malcolm X's civil rights activism and life in Inkster. Dr. Tariq A. Ramadan, adjunct professor at Wayne State University's Department of Anthropology and project manager at Project We Hope, Dream, and Believe, along with Aaron Sims, founder and executive director of Project We Hope, Dream, and Believe, will discuss their collective efforts to preserve and renovate Malcolm X's Inkster home. This program is facilitated by Chris Bloodworth, librarian at the Detroit Public Library. Thank you. We're in for a, I believe, in for a transformative learning experience on this historic day. Malcolm X was slain at the Autobahn Ballroom in Harlem, New York. However, his revolutionary and visionary legacy remains relevant and urgent to this day. And you'll find that it was nurtured here at this modest bungalow, although you could correct me, uh, Dr. Gronadon, this, this modest bungalow style home at 40, 4336 William Street in Inkster, Michigan. Tonight, we have two key presenters from Project We Hope, Dream, and Believe here to discuss their renovation efforts and future plans for Malcolm X's Inkster home. First, we have Dr. Tarek yes, A. Tarek. Yes. Tarek A. Ramadan. He is an interdisciplinary professor of anthropology and Near Eastern Studies at Wayne State University and project manager of the Malcolm X Home Restoration. Let us welcome Dr. Ramadan. Hello everyone, how are you? Thank you all for coming. We uh, deeply appreciate it that you could join us on this, uh, this, this important day. It's important for obvious, for, for obvious reasons it's the day that Malcolm was slain as Mr. Butterworth uh, had uh, just uh, informed us. And so uh, before we begin the actual uh, discussion regarding the home preservation project, uh, I had a poem uh, that I had written a few years ago regarding uh, this particular day and in regards to the assassination of Malcolm X. So I can begin with that first before we head on to the first slide here. Okay. It's called Brother Malcolm. Turbulence and tears had already made reservations before you took your last stand. Hardly subdued by the lingering, hardly subdued by the lingering anticipation of death, as if your intuition and legacy were on trial. Humanity lost all credibility that day, and the winter sun set in anguish, and still the morning lingers, incessant, expedited, and magnified by the dysfunction of a world wrought with antipathy, where the just remain unjustifiably estranged from institutions whose moral duties were to seek truth. Yet the truth remains latent in its articulation. With each ensuing decade, though, your voice continues to resonate, reaching new generations, yet speaking to the same sentiments. History remembers your potent, patented prose, the extemporaneous poetry that flowed like a gasping river, little, little blaze, with candor and fire that ignited the hearts and minds of the recipients. But on this day, the spoken words would cease, leaving the speech of your soul for print. On this day, your voice was drowned out not by the typical roars of onlookers mesmerized by your wisdom and courage, but by the sound of bullets evicted from their chambers. On this day, you had greeted your constituents and enemies alike with words of peace, as alaykum, only to endure a deafening critique, then commotion morphed into unilateral war. 
In a flash, Detroit Red spilled across the wooden stage. Attendees forced to be subjected to American History X. Racing to safety, escaping with the speed of 100 Falcons, your body tended to by family. Friends and foes as metal rained upon the ballroom's altar. Yelling out to you as you took your last breath. Brother Malcolm. Mm -hmm. uh, with that being said, we want to introduce the project, which is basically started with um, Mr. Aaron Sims, Mr. Aaron Sims, and Mr. Dewan uh, Lin, who uh, essentially had heard, and I'll let Aaron and, and, and Dewan talk about this um, in a few moments. Uh, they are actually the ones who had heard the various um, articulations about stories related to Malcolm's life in Inkster, and uh, it is it is them. Uh, that actually introduced the rest of the team into the fold. And so began the project to essentially save Malcolm's house. Um, and this is just uh, a representation of uh, our team. We've been working together for the past several years now um, on trying to uh, save, preserve, and ultimately transform the home. Uh, some of the board members are actually with us today. Um, Mr. Arthur Edge, Mr. Shaka Wilson, Mr. Dewan Lin, and Mr. Aaron Sims. And <clears throat> uh, project we hope and believe is dedicated to honoring and preserving Malcolm X's former home as life is like to see in his history through documentation, community engagement, and education. Um, this is the mission statement of the group, and we have been working hard to preserve as many aspects and elements of Malcolm's life, his history, including the history that has not been necessarily recorded or documented. Mm -hmm. Now, who was Malcolm? Depends on your perspective of Malcolm. Malcolm was a multifaceted character who lived a very truncated life, but as a historical figure, he's probably one of the most well-known uh, that American history has ever produced. Uh, Malcolm was a social revolutionary, civil rights activist, human rights leader, a nation of Islam minister, a black nationalist, a Michigander, a Detroiter, but also, uh, important to our discussion today, a resident of the city of Inkster. So at the time he was a resident, it was actually just a village. Uh, Malcolm himself, about a week before he was assassinated, actually, um, uh, very clearly, in one of his final speeches on February 14, 1965, uh, made a point to mention that he was, in fact, a Detroiter and that he used to live in Inkster. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the few accounts we have where he is in fact um, stating this in any sort of record. Outside the FBI files, which uh, clearly show his residence in Inkster, uh, there aren't many instances where Malcolm himself actually says this. And so uh, it's, it's important. Again, it's a week before he was assassinated on February 14, 1965, uh, in, a, in a very lengthy speech after his home had gotten firebombed. Uh, he actually flew to Detroit, mm -hmm. um, still, still reeking of the smoke from the uh, explosion at his house and was uh, able to uh, give, give, a, give a long speech. And in that speech, he okay, actually, is there a way to actually play the sound? There's a, I'm not sure if that's possible through this uh, through the device, but if not, um, maybe I can, if you'd like to hear his voice actually saying it. Mm -hmm. uh, here we go. I'm just gonna try to control it. The audio is not very loud, but he says, I'm from Detroit. I still want to see Do you like that? I'm not sure if we can continue the dialogue or though. You guys hear that? Okay, good. All right. So he says, I'm from Detroit. I used to live out here in Inkster. Okay. All right. Uh, so Malcolm arrives in Inkster in, uh, in August 1952. He arrives on August 8th. On August 7th, he's paroled by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Parole Board, and he uh, essentially uh, acquires his. Uh, um, uh, acquires his, his, his liberty from uh, being in prison for about six and a half years or so. Um, so he's paroled in 52, and then he leaves in chapter 12 of his autobiography. actually talks about his preparation, what he did after he uh, left prison. He went to Sister Ella Collins' home uh, in, in, um, in, in Boston, and then from there prepped himself. And the next day, uh, Malcolm boarded a bus and headed over to Michigan. Uh, there were certain stipulations regarding his parole, and so uh, this is the actual parole certificate that he signed the day before he arrived in Inkster, August 7th, 1952. You hear it, he's got his name here, Malcolm Little, 
um, sign down here. And here's the date, the 7th of August of 52. Mm -hmm. So um, the terms of his parole actually sh actually really shaped his life in Ixter. There were things he couldn't do, things he could do, things he had to inform the parolee, uh, the parole officers of. And so things like, uh, you know, where he could work or, you know, where he was going to be living. If he were to move from place to place, he had to essentially inform the parole officer uh, about his whereabouts, about where he'd work, about his employment, about who he's associating with and all that kind of stuff. So there was all kinds of um, basically records of Malcolm when he arrived in Ixter because on top of having to essentially report his whereabouts, uh, he was also being surveilled since at least 1950, okay, because of his political uh, disposition, his, his critique of U.S. foreign policy. Um, he was on the FBI's radar, and so there's a substantial record, and in fact, uh, the, um, the book to the very far right over there uh, is his FBI file, and in fact, it includes plenty of insight into Malcolm's whereabouts as he was being surveilled by the FBI um, uh, and here in Detroit, working alongside the Wayne County Sheriff's Department and the, the DPD as well. So there's a pretty substantial record about, about Malcolm in the early kind of period of his life, right? Uh, post prison, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the closest photo we could find to his arrival in August of 52. And this is from July 1st of 52. So about a month before Malcolm's release from prison, this is a, a photo of this. So we can imagine that Malcolm looked like this when he came to Inkster in 52. He had short hair. It has been corroborated by the neighbors as well. There were neighbors we spoke to. We're trying to collect oral history regarding the house. We spoke to neighbors and they described Malcolm in a very, in a very similar way, with, with short hair, but also a, red, a, a reddish uh, a goatee and, and obviously very tall. So this is a photo taken about a month or so before Malcolm arrives in Inkster. July 1st of 52, he makes it to Inkster on August 8th of 52. So he arrives by bus and he begins living with his elder brother who was really critical to Malcolm's adoption of the Nation of Islam's views. Uh, Wilford was himself an official within the Detroit uh, Mosque, Temple Number no. 1 in Detroit uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the 40s and early 50s. And so um, he really helped to introduce Malcolm to the nation, helped really kind of facilitate his conversion to the Nation of Islam. And he also invited, part of the sort of stipulations regarding the parole was that Malcolm had to find lawful employment, had to live in a, in a basically a healthy home. And so Wilford, Wilford brought him in. Wilford had uh, him and his wife, Ruth, and his children, he had two children, and uh, invited Malcolm to live uh, with him, got him a job. Uh, that was kind of all worked out prior to his arrival. And so when Malcolm arrived at the house, he began working with him at cut rate, uh, the department store. It was a furniture store. Uh, that it was actually furniture that Malcolm uh, would, would be selling. Uh, he, he also works at other places as well. Uh, Robert Turley, for example, who's a uh, local Inkster historian, has also documented or at least collected oral history regarding Malcolm, um, kind of Malcolm's life in the city of Inkster. And so there are also instances in which Malcolm was working at, uh, locally uh, for a uh, taxi cab company, a local cab company. He also was uh, working um, basically selling uh, home products as well um, with a local neighbor that lived about two, two, house, or two streets over. And so uh, Malcolm also worked with Garwood Industries in Wayne. He also worked with uh, the Lincoln Mercury stamping plants as well. Um, so he worked for a Ford Motor Company uh, too. Uh, and this happened between the late, late, late 52 and early 53, and then becomes an assistant uh, minister of the Nation of Islam. So uh, Malcolm, you know, had, had, I think it's hard, it's somewhat difficult for us to imagine Malcolm having worked, you know, blue collar jobs prior to his ascent to the Nation of Islam. But, this is something that uh, Chris and I, Mr. Bloodworth and I were talking about before the, um, before the, uh, the, the, the talk, was that uh, Malcolm did in fact work uh, a, number of, a number of jobs mm -hmm. uh, prior to his ascent into the public arena. And many of them were, again, were local jobs. He was also enrolled in the UAW 900 as well upon his uh, employment with uh, Ford Motor Company. This is the document that essentially uh, provides us with the documentary proof of where Malcolm was residing. And it was this document, I believe, that Mr. Aaron Sims um, relied upon in substantiating the oral history about Malcolm living in Inkster. And I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll, um, Mr. Aaron Sims can actually talk about that um, um, in, in this discussion today. But this document essentially provides the address for Malcolm X. Here he's listed as Malcolm K. Little. Um, again, this is part of his FBI surveillance. This is an office memorandum that was circulating between um, different law enforcement agencies. 
um, or keep track of his whereabouts, you know, where he went, um, things like Malcolm's health, Malcolm action towards some serious medical issues uh, upon arriving in Inkster as well. Uh, and that can also be found in the FBI files. And that may have had an effect on his, his employment. He wasn't able to work for very long periods of time in strenuous jobs with either Garwood Industries as a grinder or with uh, the stamping plant, the Lincoln Mercury stamping plant, and, or the local construction that he initially worked when he arrived in Inkster. So that may have had a role. It doesn't, obviously the exact medical details are, are have been re retracted from the actual documents, but uh, Malcolm was ill when he arrived. And that illness seemed to have gone into the early 53 as well. Okay. But this is the document. It's an important, obviously an important historical piece and helping to provide some historical context to Malcolm's whereabouts um, in the early 1950s. Now, Inkster was just a village at the time when Malcolm arrived, there was maybe a population of something like 17,000 or so. So it was a, you know, a, a small, you know, quiet town, really. Um, and um, uh, many black families began to move into Inkster in search of the automotive industry jobs. And so many African Americans often were prevented from living in segregated cities. Uh, Malcolm himself talks about how, um, how Dearborn at the time was still incredibly racist. You know, he, he likens uh, Dearborn to, to the South, to Mississippi, right? Um, you know, even remarks about how uh, essentially the, you know, the political leaders, for example, in, in, in Dearborn are, are like the Klan. Uh, and so Durban was, in fact, well known for its anti-black racism and anti-black animus that was widespread in the city at the time. And Malcolm talks about that again in that same speech a week before he's killed. Now, uh, oftentimes, Inkster gets looked over. There are some references in Manny Maribel's book, for example, on the uh, life of reinvention, uh, talks about in Les Payne's book. There's also mention of Inkster, too. But outside of um, those two major biographies, uh, in my, Malcolm's own autobiography, there's no mention of Inkster, right, with Ali, Al Taylor. And Al Taylor had relatives in Inkster, and, you know, obviously, you know, Inkster was a village, and most people had never heard of Inkster outside of, of outside the area, and so that makes sense. And, but the reality is that the backdrop to many events in Malcolm's life were actually happening, not in Detroit, but in Inkster. Now, he does obviously have an extensive association with Detroit. It goes back, right? We know that. Uh, but Inkster gets overlooked. And in fact, Inkster is one of those very transitional sort of moments in his life where he goes from being an imprisoned, you know, man on the East Coast to essentially becoming a nation of Islam minister and then ultimately a public figure. And that happens, really the basis of that is in Inkster. And that's where the, that's where it, it really, life uh, as a public figure from Malcolm begins. And now, um, it's one of the few surviving residences that still exist that Malcolm lived in for any serious period of time. Right. Uh, this is an old picture from 1967. It was donated to us by a, um, a neighbor who was a young girl when she remembers Malcolm. She actually lived in the house next door to, uh, to uh, Wilfred Little and Ruth Little and remembers Malcolm. I actually talked about how Malcolm would sit on the front porch and read newspapers and magazines and things like that. And so um, we do have, in fact, people old. Um, we do have, in fact, accounts from neighbors of Malcolm who lived there in the 1950s, provided with some photos and some, uh, some oral history that we're collecting as well. So Malcolm's life as a free practicing Muslim begins here. And he talks about this in chapter 12. He describes the kind of uh, the Islamic rituals regarding prayer mm -hmm. and how he, you know, prayed with his family and the, the ritual pre-prayer ablution that he would do, the wash before the prayer. That's all documented in his book. And so it happens at this house. And in fact, the, the very bathtub um, that Malcolm likely would have used to do the pre-prayer wash still exists and is still in the house. It's one mm -hmm. of the few sort of original items that remains in the home. And so we still have that. It's a cast iron uh, tub. Uh, and Malcolm's formal membership in the Nation of Islam begins here too. So the house is significant for all kinds of reasons, right? In particular, to where he essentially lives his life as a, as a free Muslim, right? Outside of, outside of prison. Um, it's the house of his brother, who was already a major official in the Nation of Islam in Detroit. It's where Malcolm's membership in the Nation of Islam be begins formally. And it's where he essentially acquires the X. He was using the X in letters prior to his arrival at the house, right? But the formal uh, adoption of the name Malcolm X happens when he arrives here and then goes to Chicago to meet the Nation of Islam's leader, Elijah Muhammad. And there he gets the formal. That happens sometime in likely the end of August into September 52. It's not clear exactly when it happens, but I think his biography talks about it being an autobiography in like September or so. So that happens while he's living here with, with, um, with his brother Wilford and the family. This is actually a photo of, him, uh, of Malcolm with his brother Wilford, who he lived with, and this is other. Uh, Brother Gilbert. Now we don't have because of time constraints. We don't have time to go into all the details of Malcolm's biography and his life. We want to kind of narrow um, the historical sort of period on Inkster. 
Um, if you're not familiar with Inkster, it's west of Detroit. Um, it's a it's a small town. Um, the home is located right off of uh, really off of uh, Inkster and Annapolis, and not that far off of Inkster Road. That's right at four three three six William Street. Now, Mr. Sims and, and and Mr. Lynn and others involved in the community were actually really pivotal in preventing the house from being demolished. There were other homes here, 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 and here, here. They're, they're all gone. And so that house, uh, fortunately, uh, was saved by uh, by the efforts of uh, what became Project We Hope for Mobility. This is an old map of uh, the village of Inkster from the 1930s. And as you can see, William Street is right over here. Uh, so Mr. Sims and Mr. Lynn and other members of the community began the first efforts to preserve the home, the home in, in, uh, in 07. Uh, they acquired the home in 2014, saved it from demolition, and uh, it generated a lot of local interest. People had always heard about Malcolm living there or some store related to Malcolm uh, or Malcolm's family. And so um, it generated a lot of interest and enthusiasm about preserving the home. And so we are sort of currently now in the early development or the early stages of renovations. So the home was built in 1950. That's what we that's what we think that's what the records at least show us. It's a very small home, under 800 square feet. Um, and uh, right now the house was located like this. It'll actually be the home roof has been has been removed and, and, and repaired. Uh, the siding has been removed as well. And so it's taking on uh, really a life of its own. These are previous photos from the summer. The home. It's a really kind of a quiet, unassuming bungalow. It looks like most of the, most of their homes in the, uh, in, the in the area. Not, not particularly any different. Um, the condition obviously is, is, is quite bad, um, but it's certainly undergoing a, uh, a pretty remarkable renovation process right now. Here's some photos of the interior of the house, to give you an idea of what it looks like. And once the home is done, it's going to be renovated so that it looks like it did in the early 1950s. So it's not going to look like a modern home, it's going to look like a home from the 50s. And Mr. Arthur Ed is actually the, the person in charge of the renovations. And, the construction and he is the one that's going to make the home look like it did mm -hmm. when Malcolm and Wilfred and Ruth lived there mm -hmm. in the early 50s. So um yeah so this obviously it's, it's hard to kind of imagine what the, what the home looked like but uh it is believed that Malcolm may have lived in the upper attic part of the bungalow and it's not clear we don't know for certain but we did find a picture where Malcolm is in what clearly looks like the upper attic level of a bungalow um but we don't know precisely <laughs> where this picture was taken. Um, and this is the actual bungalow attic in the home in Inkster over here to the left. So we're, yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying to find out if, if this happened here. So I mean, what, are, what, are your, what are your guesses? It, it looks like. Yes, from the uh, photo and looking at the architect and design of the attic, I would say that was the same location. Yeah, yeah, and so um, there's a window in each end of the room. It's hard to say how it's positioned precisely. There's a door here, and so this could have been the door over here, but it's not. Again, it's not. It's not clear. So it's something we're trying to uh, to further kind of investigate. Now, in terms of the progress we made at the house, we were able to secure a three hundred eighty thousand dollar grant through the uh, National Park uh, Service um, African American Civil Rights Grant through the uh, Historic Preservation Fund which gave us this grant in 2021. And so we've been using this to essentially rehabilitate the home. Um, and that happened in the summer. By the fall, we ended up landing the home on the National Register of Historic Places. So it is, in fact, officially listed as a, as a uh, historic, um, uh, historic building. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. And we filed it under uh, social history and, uh, and ethnic heritage. This is actually the front cover of the Detroit News. And as you can see here, Mr. Aaron Sims and Mr. Dewan Lim are both in the front cover here, standing inside what was then the living room of the home. By the summer 20, 2022, we, uh, because I'm a Wayne State professor and also um, a project manager with, with the nonprofit, uh, we actually joined forces together and ended up essentially conducting archaeological excavations at the house to help really inform us about the social history of the home. The home the, the, the geography, the community. And so it really produced all kinds of information that we were really unaware of. It brought people in from out of state, from outside the community. It brought in former residents, former community members, people who are in the community today, who came to us with different stories and photos and recollections and 
So we're able to kind of document all of that in, alongside the findings that we came across in the home. Now it's hard, if not impossible, to link any particular you know, item to Malcolm himself. Uh, we have some interesting items that did in fact, that were recovered either by the excavations or through the renovations on Mr. Arthur Edge in which they were able to find several different artifacts that were, that were also quite relevant. So we're trying to put together a comprehensive holistic kind of analysis an overview of what Malcolm's life would have been like at the home. So it's a social history of the home, the neighborhood, the community, the city in many ways. Well, we're mm -hmm. trying to capture all of that from, from every angle that we can. So um, they ended up making the, um, actually the, the work that we did at the house, uh, the excavations, which were led by uh, Wayne State anthropologist and historical uh, archeologist, Krista Rizewski, ended up being, uh, making it into American Archaeology Magazine for fall of 2021, mm -hmm. which was, uh, yeah, here's in fact, here's the home. These are uh, community volunteers who were essentially helping with the artifact cleaning process and, doc you know, and documentation. And so uh, it really became a, 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 a large scale kind of uh, community engaged archeological project in which people from all over Inkster participated in the, in the, uh, in the excavations and, and, uh, and really in every facet of work that we conducted there. So by 2023 renovations began, um, and the plans are to complete the renovations by the summer so that the house can actually be opened up by August of, 50, uh, August of 2023, which would mark the 71st anniversary. We want to open it up on the day that Malcolm arrived. So we're hoping that by August 8th, we can have a public opening of the house, which will not just be a house, it'll be a museum, but also highlights Malcolm's history as a civil and human rights leader, but also as a resident of Inkster. So we want to highlight this very important sort of, you know, time in his life. That, that has never received the attention that it deserves. We want to highlight that inside the house, inside the museum. So we actually have plans to um, really bring his time here in Inkster to the forefront. Here's some of the findings we came across. On the last day of excavations, again, Malcolm arrives here in 1952. On the final day of excavations, the archaeology team came across a coin dated to 1952. Mm -hmm. That's the year he Mm -hmm. comes to the home. Um, we have the neighbors who all remember Malcolm on the porch reading. And the coin was, the coin was actually found just below the porch mm -hmm. area. Now, of course, we don't know for sure. There's no way to say this came out of Malcolm's pocket. But he would spend time reading on that porch. Mm -hmm. Everyone saw him. Mm -hmm. And we do have that coin that was found below, maybe just a few inches below the surface. Yeah, and so that's yeah, that was a, was, a, was a great find. No one expected that, but uh, we were hoping to find something. We found several coins. We were hoping to find one dated this year. Underneath the home, in the crawl space, there was, in fact, this, uh, it's not a baby carriage. It's a carriage for a baby um, from the late 1950s or early 1960s. Now, is this somehow linked to Wilford's children? They were young at the time. It's not clear. It's not certain. But we're working on trying to find out if this has any, co uh, any connection to uh, Wilford and his family, mm -hmm. the, the, the stroller. Uh, several Fago cans were found on the that made one of the headlines for one of the articles. Uh, in search so for Malcolm X terms of Fago containers. We found more than Fago containers to be to be to be clear. We found several several interesting items. Um, you know, coins, uh, baby toys, building materials from the late 50s, early 60s. So there are items that potentially have a link to the family, mm -hmm. to Malcolm, to Wilford and his family. Mm -hmm. Other items that came up, in fact, these were acquired by Mr. Arthur Edge uh, and his team and, and Mr. Aaron Sims were these items here. A sweet 16 a bottle from a Detroit a bottling company, a soda company, uh, some coins, some bottle caps, some uh, glass. These glasses were also recovered too. Mm -hmm. uh, were they Malcolm glasses? We don't, we don't know. Right? <laughs> you know. We don't know. They're a pair of reading glasses, uh, but they were found inside the wall. So the idea is they probably were there for quite a while, right? Is that, is that, is that the case? Yeah. Okay. Probably were. When they were building the house, Hot bottles that we found, contact them might have just set it in the wall mm -hmm. and they closed the wall up so in perfect condition. Mm -hmm. What's the record? This is a Marlena Shaw. Oh, Marlena Shaw. And there's a few other items too from the uh, from the home that are not on here. But we're gonna actually we hope we actually hope to have all the uh, artifacts recovered from the house um, uh, through an online mm -hmm. virtual kind of exhibit. Um, but also, the home itself, once it opens, will also display some important pieces. And other pieces are also stored at Wayne State, and we're going to have displays there as well. So there's going to be more excavations, hopefully, in the future. We want a, we want a, a, a more sort of thoroughly informed 
understanding of what the neighborhood was like that Malcolm lived in, because speaking to, you know, former residents, he had interactions with a lot of different people. People have, people from all over the, uh, the, the area have recollections of Malcolm. And so we hope to uh, utilize all the resources to get the most uh, sort of comprehensive understanding of what Malcolm was like at that time. Now, Malcolm has a connection to Wayne State, so right across the street, exactly. Uh, Malcolm gave a speech here uh, in 1963 in October. Um, they're actually renovating the building right now. Um, but uh, Malcolm gave a speech here to the Independent Socialist Club at Wayne State in 63. And um, the room, the last time I was in it, which was, I think, last year or so, looked pretty it's exactly similar. like that. It's exactly like that. It hasn't like changed exactly much, like right? Now with the renovations, we don't know what the room is going to look like, right? But we hope to, in fact, you know, honor the, the um, an auditorium inside State Hall. Uh, but anyway, it's just kind of full circle. You know, Malcolm has an association with Wayne State. It goes back, you know, 60 years, and uh, Wayne State is now involved in preserving aspects of, of Malcolm's uh, legacy through the Department of Anthropology. Here are some images um, that Mr. Aaron Sims had sent me regarding the home. So the roof has been removed. Has the roof been replaced completely, Mr. Arthur? Yes. Okay. Um, there was an extensive fire in the uh, home at one time. Uh, we had to replace some of the structural members of the roof, and then we made sure that the roof was period correct. Uh, everybody wanted to put the new dimensional shingles on. They didn't have that in 19. Mm -hmm. So we went back with the tree tab and with a color that was similar to some of the pictures that we had seen. Mm -hmm. And this is what the home looks like, I believe, right now. Uh, I'm not sure if this is, uh, Mr. Blood, this is what you saw, more or less? Yes, sure, yes. Okay. Yeah. So the asbestos siding has been removed. And so um, after this, I believe the, the, the siding will go on to the next phase or? Yes, okay. the next phase will be the siding and replacing, uh, rebuilding the windows. Uh, I had a lot of companies who wanted to donate windows, but at that period, we didn't have double pane windows, so I'm going back with a company that's going to refurbish all the windows, and then there's a siding that is made, <coughs> excuse me, by Garth, and it's exact duplicate of the asbestos siding that we had removed last week. Mm -hmm. You're still making asbestos siding? No, it is, oh. this is so not, not asbestos siding. Yeah. It's exact duplicate. Oh, okay. It's a cement siding, which asbestos siding is uh, cement siding, but it had asbestos in it. But this does not contain asbestos. And because we were able to locate some of the pictures from the time, from at least the 60s, um, we're looking for earlier pictures. Uh, the color was of the home was a cream, a light cream color. And that's what it's going to be restored to, yes. right? a light cream color, like a beige color. So future plans are to rehab the home. Uh, create a museum uh, to uh, do additional uh, excavations at the home. We're in the process of getting historical marker. So we have an, you know, that official designation. Um, we have that official marker on the outside of the home that really kind of outlines both the significance of the home to Malcolm, but also highlighting Wilfred Little's uh, role as well, because I think Wilfred Little sometimes get the credit he deserves. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was a instrumental in both Malcolm's life, but also on his own merits, right? Uh, Wilfred Little was, Wilfred Little was a, a well-known and respected uh, member of the community, but also an important figure in the nation of Islam, which was also born in Detroit in 1930 as well. So there are all kinds of associations that Malcolm has with the city of Detroit, um, as does um, as does Wilford. Also, uh, the areas next to the home and across the street are also owned by the project uh, by the by the nonprofit as well. And the goal is to transform the neighboring plots of land into a uh, Malcolm X Learning Center. Is that, is that correct, Mr. Simpson? So uh, a Malcolm X Learning Center, which provides uh, vocational programs and, uh, and tutoring uh, and sort of youth empowerment programs uh, at the center next door. So that's going to be a long-term project um, down, down the road at some point. And of course, we're also going to be working on a documentary that really two of them, one that documents the project itself and the preservation, but also one that looks at Malcolm's life in Inkster and that, that very uh, important and transitional sort of moment in his life. He's not at the house for very long. By, by sometime in the 1950s, Sometime in 1953, the Nation of Islam uh, ends up sending him to the East Coast to help recruit uh, because he was looked at as such an important, and, uh, you know, really an incredible order. I mean, right? He had just, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, sort of wonderful recruiting skills and obviously incredibly articulate, well-spoken and, 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 and 
and was able to uh, uh, really help kind of bolster the uh, uh, attendees at the, at the mosque in Detroit. And so he didn't spend much time in Inkster, but that time that he did spend in Inkster was in fact some of the most remarkable, you know, kind. it's one of the most remarkable kinds of periods in his life because so much happens in a short period of time. But again, because it doesn't get the credit that it deserves or the history or attention it gets that, that other places got, you know, oftentimes the big cities are the backdrop for Malcolm's life. The smaller areas, the smaller cities, the places that are less heard of don't really get that, that um, you know, that attention. So that's what mm -hmm. we're trying to do with this project. It's really mm -hmm. try to uh, show the centrality of, of, of Inkster to Malcolm's life. It wasn't just a, a place in which he passed through. Uh, Malcolm had roots there, right? Malcolm lived there. Malcolm prayed there. Malcolm interacted with his neighbors, with the community. Malcolm had plans to build a temple in Inkster, and that's recorded in the FBI files. Uh, it doesn't actually happen, but Malcolm isn't just kind of looking at Inkster as a, as a, as a you know, as a, as a stopover or a layover. Um, he had extensive ties to members of the community, to various places of employment. Um, and so he has a very rich history in, uh, in the city, again, to the extent that he, he, he mentions it in one of his last major public speeches. What is a recall with parents need to know in a moment. And lastly, we just want to thank, there are so many people and organizations that um, have really been, uh, you know, really critical to uh, kind of keeping us encouraged and motivated to continue this project. So first and foremost, uh, thank you for, to the Detroit Public Library for uh, inviting us to this, uh, to this event and for being able to talk about this on a public platform. So we're deeply appreciative of that. Thank you. Um, but also there's so many other uh, organizations as well. I mean, there are, um, we have the Civil Rights Grant Program that provides us with the, the resources and funds that we need. Um, Wayne State. Um, Ambassador Atala Shabazz, who's the eldest daughter of Malcolm X, has also been uh, very encouraging, uh, quite directly, uh, as well. Uh, the Michigan Historic Preservation uh, Network, City of Inkster, um, the State Historic Preservation Office, and um, so many other um, organizations and institutions uh, have been really, really important in our, uh, in our work, including uh, Robert Turley, who's supposed to come here today. Robert Turley is, uh, is a local Inkster historian and a musician. Um, who also gives tours of the areas that Malcolm X visited in the city of Inkster um, every, I think at least twice a year. So uh, we're very appreciative of everyone and uh, thank all of you as well for, for coming and being part of this, uh, uh, this very important uh, sort of occasion. So uh, thank you. Um, do you want to um, just kind of talk about the, uh, I think the most important part would be the uh, is the contractor oh, manager of, of the, for the Malcolm X home restoration and the uh, so he's going to uh, write a. Uh, I this I project here. I belong to a we were leaving the range, and they said, "All right, we're going to go out here and help clean out the mouth." I said, "Okay, I'll go. I'm going to be no." <laughs> Fast forward. I'm over the front. Uh, in the beginning stages, I reached out to a bunch of contractors. I had a contractor just wanted to do this pro bono. After that, I learned that we had this grant coming, so I had to say, I got to pay you for what you're doing. I had the electrical union. They were going to wire the, and they still are, going to wire the house up for me free. Because so many people that are honored to be part of this project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a friend, uh, he had a specialist company, and he tore down uh, Romney's house in uh, Palmer Woods. And he was honored to do this, and he was doing it free. But unfortunately, he left us. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm going to put something at this house 
to honor him because he was so honored to be part of this project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a, as it said, it's a small home, just a bungalow, eight, 900 square feet. But in the process of this, this house is going to look just like it did in the 50s. Mm -hmm. I've had all kind of people that want to, you know, as I said, want to come in and do things uh, or be part of it, just to say they're part of it, different window companies. And, but no, it didn't have modern windows. It did have uh, the, the new dimensional roofing that you have. It's going to look just like it did. When you come out the walls, you're not going to be looking at no plastic pump plumbing. You're going to be looking at galvanized pipe. Mm -hmm. I have a young lady. Uh, she is the first master plumber, female master plumber, and black in the country. Mm -hmm. And she's got to hook up with me with Kohler to come in with the toilets and sink to match it. Mm -hmm. I have a gentleman who did the historical lights, all the lights in the state capitol when he they renovated. And if you go to the state capitol and see those some of the lights in there, there's some of them are probably twice as tall as me. Uh, I was just amazed because when he reached out to me, he said that he wants to just reduplicate the light fixtures, the electrical fixtures, because he just wants to be part of it. So I'm going to be reaching out to him. This is a historical place that our children, as they stated, a learning center will be coming later, that they can learn the history of Malcolm X and Inkster. Mm -hmm. uh, even the city of Inkster has reached out to us because of uh, they realized once we finish, it's going to be a lot of people coming That's to right. see this. That's right. Mm -hmm. And prior to me, what I did before this, I retired from the city of Detroit. Uh, it'd be a year in April. I was over at Blight in demolition. Uh, and it was a personal thing for me because with the Blight, it hurt me for our children to see this Blight mm -hmm. because at young ages, mm -hmm that's embedded in their mind, they think that's normal. Mm -hmm. So with the Inkster reaching out to us, I informed him that's the same concerns that I had, is a, it would be a bad image for Inkster once we finish this house to people coming to see some of the blight that may be in the area. So they're working with us to make sure that the beautification around the Melbourne X house is being done in conjunction with what we are doing with the Malcolm X House. I just want to thank Project Hope, Dream, Believe mm -hmm. for allowing me to be over this project. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Aaron, every time I do something, it's almost tears in his eyes with happiness. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Aaron, for saving this house. Mm -hmm. Give him a hand. Mm -hmm. So, as we move forward, uh, there's been a few stories that's been out there. Uh, one story we did when we were putting the roof up, it made national. Mm -hmm. My cousin called me. She waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning <laughs> in my voice on our TV in Washington, D.C. So, uh, so this is very important to not only Inkster, mm -hmm. but the whole country. That's right. That's right. So as we move forward, we will keep you abreast of what's going on with the stories. And once it's finished, we want to invite all of you out mm -hmm. to see. Mm -hmm. And as we finish, I reach out to uh, I don't know if any of you heard of uh, the Breakfast Club, the Art. Mm -hmm. Trey okay. Fine, Breakfast Club. So uh, I talked with them and Mr. Henry Harper, who was the uh, president over that. And I want to shut down William Street and have a Black Art show mm -hmm. around the Melbourne mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I'm going to do everything I can on my end, along with Project, 
we hope, dream, and believe to make is a historical place that everyone will be proud of. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, perhaps this one. There's there. Okay, here's Aaron Sims, exec founder and executive director of the project that we hope Dream Game Community. That's right, that's right. Um, my name is Aaron. Um, uh, the story is real simple. Um, we were uh, experiencing hard times in the city of Kingston. Um, grass wasn't getting cut and stuff like that. So uh, I assembled a whole group of people and we started cutting like abandoned lots and senior uh, yards in the city of Kingston. And uh, when we got done for the day, me and Dewan, uh we pulled over to the side and we sat on the back of the car. And we was like, man, do you really think that Malcolm X lived in Inkster? We don't know where it came from. It, it just popped up because Inkster has, we had a, a place in Inkster. It was called the Malcolm X Culture Center. And it was the first center in the world that was named after uh, Malcolm X before mm -hmm. anybody else did. And uh, we used to hear our parents talk about doing karate and like everything, like learning, skating, all this stuff. So uh, me and Dewan just sat on the back of the car and we just started like looking for information. We couldn't find nothing. And so I told Dewan, I was like, I know who would have information if he really lived in Inkster. And uh, we Googled Malcolm X FBI file. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, when the file came up, me and Dewan looked at the phone for like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And we was like, should we go? Mm -hmm. Like, should we flip the page? He was like, well, let's go. And I mean, we flipped the first page. It said uh, FBI file, Malcolm X. And when we flipped to the third page, we didn't see nothing. All we saw was 4336 William Street. <laughs> Me and Dewan jumped off the car. We ran around, hollering, and screaming. <laughs> and uh, we was like, put the lion boys in the car. We, we bought the gold on William Street. So if you ever been to Inkster, like the house is like literally like in the middle of the project, mm -hmm. like in the middle. Mm -hmm. And when we pulled up, we was like, man, it was like a ghost town over here. And it was only uh, three houses on the block. Mm -hmm. And so we crept by the house mm -hmm. and we started looking. I mean, we saw that address, it said 4336 William. Me and the I think we didn't even put the car in park. I think the car just like kept driving. We ran up to the porch and we was like, do it really say 4336 Williams? And uh, when it did, uh, we just sat there. And mind you, the grass has never been cut. Mm -hmm. So when we got there, the grass had to be probably about waist high to me. Mm -hmm. And um, me and Dewan just sat on the porch. Mm -hmm. Well, we sat on the porch for probably about like two, three hours. Yeah. We just sat there. And uh, I dropped the wine off at home, and I'm a person who don't never sleep. I never sleep. I think I called the wine about 3:30 in the morning. <laughs> the wine answered the phone. He said, "Hello." I said, "Real quick, we gonna own that house." And hung the phone up. <laughs> and uh, when I talked to him next day, he's like, "Did you call me last night in the morning?" And uh, from that point, it's just been like an everyday fight uh, for that house. Um, just, I mean, from 2007 all the way to 2014. One year it's on the demolition list, the next year it's off. Next year it's on the demolition list twice. Next year it's off. So we went to City Hall. Every time we bumped out, uh, we finally got the house in um, 2014, close to 2015. Um, the new mayor, we met with the new mayor and they came to like terms and agreement and uh, we purchased the house for a dollar. And um, that was the start of the whole uh, 
um, saving the house. Mm -hmm. um, but what we didn't know was how deep, um, not just the roots from Malcolm X, but Inkster roots of everybody who lived in Inkster. Mm -hmm. um, when we found out, like, the Haley family lived there, like Alex Haley mm -hmm. uh, family lived there, um, descendants of, of his, they own a junkyard called Hope's uh, Auto Wrecking and Inkster. Mm -hmm. um, come to find out, they're related to Lester Hope, who uh, mm -hmm. grew up in Inkster, mm -hmm. on Ash and Chestnut. Wow. Um, so the, the history just kept going. Don Barton, mm -hmm. um, Woodrow Whitlaw, uh, mm -hmm. NASA's first chief of commander. That's right. Um, the Marvelettes, mm -hmm. um, the list Stevie Wonder's uh, first wife. So when we start doing this and piecing it together, deep history. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this has been a, a great ride with great people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> I just want to add. The other day, I was out. My wife over there will be looking at houses that we can't afford. Mm -hmm. But anyways, <laughs> over in Palmer Woods and uh, they had a state sale going on at that time. So I said, well, let me just go ahead and look. I walked in there and I found a bed and a dresser that fit that period. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman gave me a deal on it, uh, $130 for the two. Uh, ordinarily, I Googled them after the same product, but when I found it somewhere else, it would have cost me almost $4,000. But God is good. He put me there at that time to get those items. Because God, you said $130, $26. I said, why it ain't in my truck? So with saying that, if anything that you have that may have fit that period, because we're going to have to uh, furnish this home, anything or artifacts or anything that fit the Malcolm, please contact us. Thank you. Let's hear it for uh, our panel. Mm -hmm. Make an additional introductions. I think we're missing a couple of people. Um, I'm Shaka. Oh, uh, 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 Shaka Wilson, yes. and she is the web developer for Project People Dream of Believe. All right. All right. All right. Uh, Dewan Lynn. And Dewan Lynn is a community activist and board member of Project We Hope Dream and Believe. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. All right. And, I, and uh, my apologies for the late introduction. I'm Christopher Bloodworth, and I am the uh, adult services uh, librarian uh, here at the Detroit Public Library. Mm -hmm. and, thank you. and at this point, uh, uh, we will uh, have uh, our, our uh, Q and A slash discussion, and, and I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, many, many of you have. Uh, a, a, a lot of questions and, and uh, points to discuss. Uh, if so, um, you can feel free to uh, either uh, come up to the, the microphone if you wish, or speak from your chair. And if um, you, and if you need to um, uh, uh, project your voice, then, then I can just uh, uh, let me know. I'll hand the mic to you. Mm -hmm. Although this was a wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. oh, this, this. <laughs> wonderful presentation. Thank you. It's very exciting. Um, my question is, how long did the little family live in that home? Do you know when they moved out? And have you had an opportunity to get in touch with 
uh, Wilford and Ruth Little's children at all to get any oral history or memories or anything, or any, any other members of the family who knew about the home and visited that home previously. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, to our knowledge, um, we believe that uh, uh, Wilford and Ruth were the first owners of the house. Um, because the house was built in the 50s. Um, we are in touch. Uh, we, uh, we communicate with uh, his old, eldest daughter, uh, Atala, who is better known as Ambassador Shabazz. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that we notice is uh, when you're telling someone's story, we get confirmation from the family. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we are in touch with them. Um, no for uh, for Ruth and uh, Wilford's children, but um, you know by it being Malcolm's, uh, I mean you know the family, his daughter's uh, cousins, uh, she relays the messages back and forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we are planning a uh, a black tie gala with uh, the little family and for Ruth and. Um, Wilford's children to be there as well. Mm -hmm, um, so we're in the plans of making that happen. Um, but yes, but we do give a lot of credit to uh, Ambassador Shabazz because mm -hmm. um, she did guide us and um, through everything. Um, I remember when we were uh, doing the historical uh, nomination, um, we were sitting there. And uh, so when you go into the process, um, they let people call in and you know say why the house should be uh, historical and uh it was funny because uh i mean probably for an hour me and her debated on the phone like i'm like look i need you to be on this phone for me. <laughs> she was like mr sims i got other things i need to be doing um, i'm part of muhammad ali's uh housing uh thing in louisville and i got a meeting there and so i called everybody i was like man like tried everything to get her to uh to be in the room and uh tart called me he was like she in the room like she's on the zoom meeting and i was like you know she said she wasn't gonna be there and uh it was so funny because when everybody started talking and they called her name off and she just spoke and everybody was like quiet mm -hmm. um and she she gave the breakdown in the history of her family and why it's important um, about the history. So yeah, so we, we do make sure we stay in contact with them and let them know uh, everything that's going on with us. That's good. Do you want to ask me? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Oh, Aaron, uh, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, is, are the, are the, the t-shirts and the hats that you and Dewan are, are wearing? Is That's that the master, man, right behind you. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, Dr. Torque is the one who designed uh, the t-shirts. Are the t-shirts are per day available? Not yet, to the, to the public, not yet, but um, possibly in the <laughs> okay, question oh, I wanted to ask what Aaron said so much. So the, there was also a question in that about um, how long did they stay at the house for the little family? It's not 100% clear. We did speak to two former neighbors who were young girls at the time. Who do, one lived across the street, one lived next door. And they recall Malcolm having come back to the same home sometime in the early 1960s. Right before. Yeah. Before, yeah. Uh, before he was assassinated. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't know precisely. We're trying to construct a, an accurate kind of chronology of like when the family lived there and when Malcolm came back. But we know at least that he did come back, um, if not the same occasion that the two uh, former neighbors were talking about, at least at least on one occasion. Mm -hmm. He did return to the house in the early 60s because they noted him as being a, a, a famous minister in the nation of Islam. So, um, yeah, just wanted to add to, to that. Uh, my question is directed towards who is remodeling the house. I appreciate you leaving the house as it was in the 50s, but with modern technology, 
hopefully you would put solar panels on there so the citizens won't have to worry about lighting it up and won't be in so much debt and running computers and, and all that. Thank you. Yes, I understand you, and it's a lot of things that I do, um, but there's so much technology out here. But as far as our history, we need to go and make it exactly like it was when he lived there. If you go out to Greenfield Village and you go to Thomas Edison's house that they put out there, it does not have solar panels on the book. So there are some things that's going to be done that we have to use because of modern technology, but as far as the appearance of the house, it's going to be looking exactly like it was in the 50s when Malcolm lived there. And how do you know what it would have looked like? Is this just from online research of the 50s? Yes, some online research, uh, some I've done, you can believe some nights I wake up in the middle of the last that lady behind you. I'm online at two or three o'clock in the morning researching things of the 50s period. And you can go online and find just, I found a stove and I looked at it and I Googled it and it matched the period of the 50s of the stove. There's cabinetry that I have to go and research. And it's all kind of companies out there that make duplications of whatever period you're looking for. And some of them duplicated with some of the stuff I want to find is original, but just as far as, again, the bathroom, the bathroom tile, I have to go, there's a place in Minnesota that makes that exact tile, so I have to order that from Minnesota to have it period correct. The bathtub, I'm leaving. And as I stated earlier, the uh, bathroom fixtures, toilet and sink and stuff, I have somebody that uh, does a lot of work for Kohler, and they're going to help me find that. But other than that, it was a simple house, four walls. I mean, two bedrooms downstairs, uh, living room, dining, living room, kitchen, large kitchen, dining room area, and no basement. And the bungalow upstairs, which was finished, uh, that I'm going to duplicate that and from the pictures that we talked about earlier, that possibly was where Malcolm stayed when he lived in the home. Thank you. Was that a community that was built by Ford? Because um, my grandparents lived there. I can remember the inside of that house because I was there all the time. And I have several family members that still live there. There are probably still families there that will let you go in and look at the type of cabinet because I can remember it like it was yesterday. Yes. On that note, yes, I have rolled that community in probably a square mile area, looking for some of the things. Uh, even the windows in this house has the old steel casement windows. But everybody has gone to the wall side windows <laughs> in that area. So, because I even looked at, tried to look for a house that may have been uh, in bad condition as far as finding the window. Uh, but there are companies. Uh, that will make those windows, even there's some places here in Detroit that have stockpiles of those windows. So I had to do a lot of research and find a spot because a couple, one, two, three, I had to have made, remade totally. And the other ones, they're going to just refurbish. Did, did Henry Ford build that community? Because I, I think I remember hearing that. Okay. Yes, they're saying yes. You I know. You might want to look into the Ford archives. Okay. Um, there's two locations for Ford Archives where there used to be. There used to, there's a, there was a Ford Archives in one place in Dearborn, but there was another one in the basement of uh, World Headquarters. Okay. And, and, and both of them share um, resources in terms of, of their assets. Okay. So you Thank might you. Want to look I'm going to do that. They going. built all of those houses along Evergreen yes. for their engineers and there's information in their library about that. Yes, because actually I'm... Uh, Vice President of Friends of Rouge Park, and the stores and house used to be in Rouge Park, which was That's Henry right. Ford's one of his chief engineers. That's right. So, but that sometime that has burnt down, but they still have trails and 
stone walls that surrounded his house in Bruce Park. Mm -hmm. okay. But there's a lot of homes, like you said, in the Evergreen area that Ford did build for his workers. There's a lot of pictures of there of those homes. Okay. I think you know, we'll research that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? There's still plenty of time. Okay. I just want to say big ups to the project we hope, dream, or believe. They, 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 they are community folk. So uh, a lot of people believe that historical preservation teaching history, particularly teaching black history is something that has to be done by people who got PhDs and people who got all of this. They saved this house as a community grassroots organization. And they have made this a national and international story. Now people all over the world know about this house who and know about Malcolm living in Inkster who otherwise would not have known. So that just helps that all of us to, to know that it's history all around you. And it don't always take somebody who you think is way up there to tell that history. You can play a role in preserving this history so that the other generations, the younger generations will come up knowing this history. Not as people in Inkster, young folks in Inkster will grow up knowing that Malcolm X lived in their same community. And out of the history that they found out with that, as you heard Aaron tell us, there's all this other history he uncovered. And so they're going to know about that history. That is important, especially when history is being attacked and assaulted every, every day. day. Every day. The, getting in this battle is doing what they're doing. And they didn't do this to get in a war with nobody. But just doing this kind of history, you find out it's a whole bunch of people who don't want none of this to be taught. Mm -hmm. And so for them to do this, I just always have to give it up mm -hmm. every time. <laughs> I mean, no, thank you so much for the, for the uh, incredible insights and commentary because I think that what you're saying is 100% true. I think that in this very sort of volatile political environment, there is certainly an attack. There's mm -hmm. attempts to pass legislation to ban, mm -hmm. to, you know, to obviously to, to, to ban books, to, <laughs> to uh, outright prevent the, the uh, ability to articulate history, to even to read history. So I think that what you're saying resonates, I think, quite well in this, this political atmosphere. And so, um, yeah, I think that the, the, the work that, that really that Aaron has, has begun to do over the past several years, I think, really speaks volumes to the, to the kind of um, sentiments that are that are pretty widespread especially in a community like Inkster where there's so much there's so much pride in Inkster mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the residents of Inkster are incredibly well informed about their own history as That's well right. and there is there is clearly there's been preservation of that history there's been an oral history some documented history photographs but also there's a consciousness about what is happening in Inkster uh over over the, over the course of time and so that's really been honestly an incredible resource whenever we go out to do work at the house um it isn't just uh a small team of, of project people who believe members it's always met by mm -hmm. members of the community mm -hmm. always and the generosity as well is something that is is, is astounding the, mm -hmm. the close-knit sort of feel for um, um and, and, and compassion and um just outright uh, uh you know authenticity and and, and 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 legitimate you know um feelings of, of civic pride that are uh, that are that are articulated in Easter are are really mind blowing. It's hard to really describe it with words. Yeah, you can feel it, I think, mm -hmm. more than you can, you know, mm -hmm. talk about it. So, so thank you for, for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just want to say that that inspired me. My mother and father in law, well, my mother in law grew up in Inkster as a little girl. She's 89 years old. She spent time going to squeeze every what we have about well, yeah, we have about uh, eight minutes remaining. Uh, any additional uh, uh, questions or comments?
I just want to share a resource for um, I don't know. I don't know how far the project extends at the Detroit Historical Museum. They're doing a neighborhoods project that's collecting world histories from people who live in neighborhoods in Detroit from any period. So if you're interested in participating in stuff like this, you can contact them and share. So if you collect your mother-in-law's oral history, um, you can do it for yourself, but you can also make it a part of this community archive. It'll be available to anybody. Yeah, the Detroit Historical Museum. If you go on their website and look for the neighborhoods project, I think it's something like that is what it's called. But they'll, they'll, you can submit your own or they'll do an oral history for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, uh, any other questions or comments? Well, well, before closing, oh yeah, just want to, 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 to mention the, to, uh, Mr. Rich, that, that the, the Henry Ford Centennial Library is uh, the, uh, from what I know, that it is the, the, the home of the, the, the city of Dearborn Archives. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that note, let's I, I give a warm thank you to Dr. Dr. Uh, Tarek Also, like I give yourselves a, a round of applause for and, and uh, uh, before we adjourn, I just want to bring your attention to the display table to my immediate right. On that table are, uh, are, are uh, materials on Malcolm X uh, that, 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 we, that we have here at Detroit Public Library uh, that are, that there are uh, available uh, to check out if, if, if interest. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and in case you um, don't have a Detroit Public Library card. There are also uh, a, a few uh, uh, applications uh, 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 for me to fill out. And, and, again, and again, thank you, Project We Hope, Dream of Believe. And, 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 and thanks to all of you for uh, coming out and, and uh, showing your interest and support.